Hey guys, welcome back. I decided to finally make my 2022 best books of the year, even though it is halfway through January. I have eight books that I'm classifying as my best books of the year. This is not all of my five star reads from 2022. Um, these are books that affected me the most. Plus, some of my five star reads were actually rereads. So, even though the quality was there, um, it, because it wasn't the first time I read through these books, they didn't quite have the same level of impact. So, I'm not going to be putting those in my best books of the year. If you want to, go check them out though. Go check out my Goodreads stats for 2022, and you'll see them all there. So the first book I want to talk about is Of Women and Salt by Gabriela Garcia. Um, I accidentally read this. Okay, so here's what happened. I use Chirp for uh, most of my audiobook purchases. It's a discount audiobook site. Um, you can buy audiobooks for full price, but they have wicked good discounts on stuff. And so I go through and I put in my favorites list and my wish list, and then I get notified when those go on sale. And I get emails of um, daily deals that they think I would be interested in, and I have discovered a ton of books that way. And this one came up and I was like, oh, Gabriela Garcia Marquez. No. First of all, it's Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude, which is very much on my 2023 TBR. Different author than Gabriela Garcia. Accidentally bought it and started listening to it, and I got about two chapters in. And though I've never read Gabriela Garcia Marquez, I was like, I don't think this is him. And then I looked at it and I was like, oh, I'm dumb. This is just a completely different person. Um, but I was like, you know what? I bought it and I started listening to it. So I'm going to finish it. Man, am I glad I did. I rated this about four stars. It easily can be four and a half. Um, phenomenal. This book, oh, this book, this book is hard. This book is painful. Um, I'm going to say that there are some trigger warnings I would recommend that you check out before you read this book if that is something that concerns you, specifically drug abuse and addiction, alcohol abuse and addiction, unfair immigration practices, uh, sexual assault. There's a lot, but every single one of those things was treated with such care and respect that I, I think the book would have been so much less without them. This is the story of, um, it actually follows multiple generations of this one family. It starts in Cuba before the revolution and it follows the lives of specifically the women in this family, in this generation. And one of the main POVs is the current youngest woman of the generation of that family line. And um, her family had immigrated from Cuba to Florida. And so she is an American um, by birth and obviously of um, Cuban descent and her trying to reckon with a past that her family will not talk about, trying to reckon with her identity, trying to reckon with her place in her family, her place in her community, her place in her country that doesn't always feel like her country. Um, there are a couple other POVs, one of them being um, a neighbor of hers gets um, deported by ICE and her little daughter is at school when this happens. And so our main character takes in this daughter hoping to try to find the mom. And so that is its own kind of side story that weaves in multiple points of view of immigration into the United States and the varying experiences of especially women who are trying to immigrate trying to stay under the radar, trying to stay in the United States, trying to keep their families together, um, what it's like in detention centers. So the idea of um, the salt in the book is the salt born of these women, the salt of their tears, the salt of the sweat of their brow, the, the salt of the blood, very gut-wrenching. If you, if you want an emotional book that isn't necessarily going to destroy you, but it is absolutely going to make you feel things, I would definitely recommend Of Women and Salt by Gabriela Garcia. My next book 
that I want to talk about is The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. Absolutely loved this book. This is the story of Queen Briseis. She is one of the queens of one of the Trojan cities that is sacked by Achilles. And the reason that this book focuses on her is because in um, Greek mythology, when it comes to the battle between uh, Troy and Greece, Briseis was captured by Achilles, became his prize. King Agamemnon basically demanded that Achilles hand her over to him, and Achilles didn't want to, and that's why Achilles stopped fighting, and that's why Greece was almost defeated by the Trojans. So it was a huge, huge plot point to uh, the Greek mythology about um, the Greco-Trojan War. But it's always told from the male perspective. It's always told from Achilles' perspective. It's always told from Odysseus, Odysseus' perspective. It's always told from, you know, Agamemnon. And it's told from the point of Troy, from Paris, and from King Priam. To hear it through the voice of Briseis, the woman actually captured, and not just her, but her seeing all of the women in these camps. These are all Trojan women. These are all you know, spoils of war. They're all slaves to these Grecian warriors. And these are not golden demigod uh, shining heroes. You know, these are brutal warmongers to these women. These are enslavers to these women. And the story told from her voice and from her perspective was so, so, so well done. I gave this one four stars. The reason I didn't give it five is there, there was some repetitiveness in the language and I think it was very much intentional, but I think it was just a bit too much. Um, it, it was just the tiniest bit distracting. It was not a bad experience. It, it did not at all ruin the experience. Had it just been wheedled down just the tiniest bit, um, I definitely think this would, this would have been a five-star read. Um, Briseis's voice and her observations of Achilles and Patrocles and um, the overall structure of this Grecian force and what they were doing to the people of Troy. The pointlessness of war for the sake of men's egos. Phenomenal. Absolutely loved it and I would highly recommend The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. The next best book of 2022 for me, which was a five-star read, Address Unknown by Katherine Cressman Taylor. I'm not going to get tongue twisted on that again. Oh my god. Okay, so this book is tiny. You can see. Oh, does this pack a punch though? This is the story of two men who are dear, dear, dear friends. Um, and after World War I, they both went to the United States and they set up shop in San Francisco and they own an art gallery. One of them decides to return to Germany just before the start of World War II and the other stays in San Francisco. And so they are corresponding back and forth, um, building their art business and serving the Jewish community at large and San Francisco in particular because it had a large Jewish population and the man who stayed in San Francisco is Jewish. His friend who went back to Germany is not Jewish. So you see through letters that are no more than a page, page and a half at times, the relationship and its devolving while the man in Germany is buying into Hitler's propaganda. He is starting to believe that his Jewish friend is the exception and not the rule. Uh, Jews are a monolith, Jews are a scourge on society, and Hitler has the solution. The man in San Francisco is having a really hard time believing his absolutely dear friend could possibly think this way. These letters back and forth, just in tiny snapshots, tell such an amazingly powerful story. And you go through so many emotions while you're reading this. You go through fear, you go through disappointment, you go through indignation, you go through rage and calling for blood almost. I am, I am amazed at what this book did to me in such a short time. Additionally to that, the foreword that was written um, actually talks about race relations in the United States and specifically what happened with George Floyd 
um, in relation to dehumanizing groups and populations of people and what that does to the overall society. I did not realize that was going to be in the foreword, and when it did, uh, I, it just, it, I just broke down, honestly. Reading about these two men's relationships as Hitler's coming to power and the desensitization of the German people is one thing. There is a step of removal, though, um, when you read about something that happened in front of your eyes um, to a community that you care very, very much about, it's, it just brings it home even more. And so it, I, just, I cannot recommend this book enough. Everybody should be reading this book. The interesting thing about this book is that this was written prior to the actual atrocities of the Holocaust that happened. Um, there was this American woman who was hearing what was coming out of Germany and was terrified about what that meant. And so she wrote this book to try to wake people up to say, this is not something we can ignore. This is only going to get worse. And it was published before Hitler really was the Hitler that we think of today. And nobody listened. I, and it's hard to say that nobody listened because in the back of the book, her son talks about how wildly popular this book was. I think this was the only book of its time that Reader's Digest ever published in full. And it, it is an incredibly short story, but that, had, but that was unheard of. So many people read this, so many people thought this was important, and still what happened happened. Still the people that had the power to do something about it turned a blind eye to it. Phenomenal read. Every single person should read this. Address unknown. Please, please, please pick this up. It is worth every penny. My next five star, one of my best reads of 2022 is Circe. Oh, fell in my face. Circe by Madeline Miller. I loved this book. I actually read this as an audiobook, and then as soon as I finished it, I ran to the bookstore and I picked up a physical copy, also because this cover is absolutely gorgeous, but because I had to own this. Um, I got this through, I think I read this in Libby, and so I had to give it back. And so I'm like, no, I have to own this book. I did not have that experience with many of the books that I read. Most of the books that I got through in 2022 were audiobooks. Um, a good amount of those were from Libby. So they were library books that I had on loan and I do not own a copy of. Um, a good amount I did get through Chirp and so I do own them, um, but I don't think Cersei is one of them. I want to buy the audiobook copy of this. So I think I put it on my wish list. So when it goes on sale again, I'm going to be picking this up because the audiobook was absolutely phenomenal. So this is a retelling of Circe. She was the daughter of um, the Greek Titan. I want to say Apollo. It's not Apollo. Greek Titan Helios, God of the Sun, and a water nymph. And so unlike most of her siblings, she really wasn't a demigod. She was not a god. Um, she did not really have any abilities other than what were naturally born with her coming from a water nymph, AKA she can breathe underwater. She can travel through water just fine. Um, but that's more of, she's a child of the sea and less of, she has the powers of a divine being. Um, so eventually she gets, uh, exiled to an Island and she realizes she does have powers. Uh, they're not innate to her like a Greek god would be. Um, so she's considered more of a witch because she can make things happen from the elements around her, the plants specifically. And she does uh, end up gaining mastery over this. And whereas most people would hate being exiled to an island, she absolutely loved it. She wanted to be by herself. This girl's an introvert. I can relate. Quarantine was the greatest time of my life other than the fact that it was due to a pandemic. But her story, told from her perspective, absolutely amazing. Um, part of the reason that she is well known is because on Odysseus's journey back from the Trojan War, he actually uh, stops on her island. Um, he kind of falls in love with her. And even though he desperately wants to get back to his wife, that's like one of his personality traits, he does have a child with Cersei. He doesn't realize when he leaves that she is pregnant, but she does end up having his son. Athena reveals, I think the fates had predicted or the fates had deigned, um, that her son will kill his father. He will kill Odysseus. And so Athena comes to stop that from happening because Odysseus is one of her champions. This book is so 
good. I can't even really describe why it's so good, but one of the things that really stands out to me is the language of water in this book. I grew up around the water. I grew up swimming. I grew up in a family of people who swim and just the water is home to me. The language that Madeline Miller uses to talk about Cersei and her relationship to the water is just phenomenal. It is so beautiful and it it's a part of her and she's a part of it. And that does feature into such a big part of the writing style overall. It's not the main plot point by any means, but it adds so much depth, no pun intended, to her character and her story. This is actually the reason I read The Silence of the Girls, because I finished this and I'm like, I need more. I need this, but again and new. And honestly, The Song of Achilles doesn't really appeal to me as a topic. I loved the female focus of Cersei, and I was looking for more of that, um, more so than just um, from the same author. And so when I found The Silence of the Girls, it wasn't quite as good as Cersei, but it was very close. And it definitely uh, kind of scratched that itch that I still had after reading Cersei. So if you can only pick up one of them though, I'm gonna recommend Cersei by Madeline Miller. Uh, the next book uh, was another, another audiobook that I read, and that is We Are Not Free by Tracy Chee. This follows, I think like 18 different points of view. It's a lot of different points of view. These are all Japanese American teenagers um, at the kind of the beginning of America getting involved in World War II. And this is after basically Pearl Harbor. And so it is these teenagers and their families as they are brought to internment camps. Oh my gosh. So this book could have focused so heavily on the trauma of that and the injustice of that and it would have absolutely been within its right to but what this book focused on was how these young people coming into adulthood and these younger teenagers coming into their middle and older teenage years dealt with that trauma it didn't focus so much on the trauma itself but it focused on how these kids formed community with themselves. There was such a disconnect in so many of these families between the parents and their teenagers because these these parents, um, I want to say all of them, were uh, from Japan. And so these the parents literally were from another world than their teenagers. Their teenagers all, their kids all grew up American. They were all born Americans. They were all, you know, raised in American culture and society. And so even though they had a multitude of different family dynamics, you know, parents that didn't understand their kids, didn't have um, affectionate, deep, loving relationships with their kids, um, families that absolutely had really close, beautifully tight relationships, um, families who had lost one or more parents, such a wide variety. But there was very much a disconnect between these Japanese American kids and their Japanese parents living in America. And how, as time went on, these families started to either fracture or draw closer together. But no matter what, these kids formed this bond of friendship that turned them into a family unit themselves strength of the human spirit, the the power of friendship, the power of found family, the power of um, becoming independent and deciding who you want to be. Just, oh my gosh, I cried. I cried so many times in this book. It was so beautiful. Every single character felt so incredibly real, so incredibly fleshed out. Even though there were so many because it changed to different points of view, you you got different points of view of the same person. You didn't just get their first person narrative of how they felt, how they saw the world. You got the narrative of their friends and how their friends viewed them. And so you had these really complete pictures of all of these characters. And it was just so, so well done. 
I would definitely recommend the audiobook version of this. And specifically because there are so many different points of view, the audiobook had multiple narrators reading this. They had um, multiple female voices, multiple male voices. And so it wasn't so confusing as to who was speaking, who was narrating their life at this point. And so it, you, I felt that the, the audiobook helped you keep track of who you were following in that moment instead of getting lost with it. I think if you were reading it straight on page, um, you might have trouble separating the different characters because you're flipping between so many of them and they're talking all about the same group of kids. And so you're like, wait a minute, I thought we were talking from so-and-so's perspective, but now whoever's perspective is talking is talking about this person. Get the audiobook. Audiobook was absolutely, absolutely wonderful. And I cannot recommend this book enough. This is another book that I want to own. I absolutely want the audiobook version of this. I want everybody I know to read this book. And I I don't know if I'm going to be rereading it in 2023 because I, I do have a pretty ambitious list of books already that I want to get finished this year. But I want to reread this book for sure. So five stars. We Are Not Free by Tracy Chi. Okay. I read a lot of mysteries this year. I read a good amount of Arthur Conan Doyle. I read a good amount of Agatha Christie. And I read three books by Keigo Higashino. I read The Devotion of Suspect X, uh, Devotion of Saint, and Malice. Not in that order. I read them all weird. Uh, two of the three were pretty good. Pretty darn good. Devotion of Suspect X. Oh my goodness. Blew me away. I thought I had it. I thought I had it. The interesting thing about Keigo Higashino's writings that I've noticed right from the beginning, you know who the murderer is. It's less about solving the mystery of what happened and who did it as to why it happened and what led up to it happening. And so you're following the police investigation and sometimes the actual perpetrator to try to piece together the story that led to the event, because the books usually start out with the event. Um, in Malice, it was a little bit different. There was kind of a lead up, um, maybe, I'm not even gonna say halfway, I don't think, it was before that, where you realize, oh, this is exactly what happened, this is who did it. But again, and then it follows that pattern of the rest of the story is trying to figure out the why, what led up to it. Oh, Devotion of Suspect X though. I thought with all the mysteries that I'd read, I was gonna be able to figured out. I was going to know exactly what was happening. I thought I was picking up on stuff, undercurrents and things. Oh, oh, the author doesn't think I'm going to pick up on that, but I totally picked up on that. And so I know what's going to happen. No, no, I fell for the bait. He purposely put it out there and in such a way that you think you're not supposed to pick up on it, but you do pick up on it. I, I was blown away. I was, I was caught off guard and it was fantastic. It was fantastic. I absolutely adored it. One or two lines in it, actually, especially towards the end, I was pacing um, in in between my, my bedroom and my home office, and I was listening to it, and a line came up, and I literally stopped dead in my tracks. It was such a beautifully written, powerfully evocative line and I literally just stopped in my tracks and stared at the floor while I pondered it. it just oh so good so good uh so if you like mysteries if you like character studies and mysteries or one or the other so devotion of suspect x keigo hikachi no go read it all right we're down to our final two which are actually the first two books I read in 2020. Two. I, I keep wanting to say 2023. Okay, the first one was a book that I swore I would never read because I was a pretentious brat growing up. Um, swore I was never going to read it. And then finally, when I started picking up reading again in May of last year, first time I've read in years and years, I decided, okay, fine, I'll try it, but I'm going to hate it and I'm going to rip it to shreds. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. I realized about halfway through that I loved it. And I was like, oh, I'm in trouble. 
And then I finished it and I was like, oh my goodness, this was five stars. I 100% thought I was gonna hate this book. I don't really care about romance as a genre. Um, that's not to say I, 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 th I don't think people should read, like, I, I don't have anything against the genre for other readers. It's just, to me, it does not seem like a genre that I'm gonna give a rat's butt about. I need more than two people existing in a book solely to get together. I, I just, I thought that's what Jane Austen in general was gonna be. Um, that's why I didn't wanna read any of the Bronte sisters. I assumed that's what they were all gonna be. This was so good. This was so good. First of all, it was really funny. I did not realize it was gonna be this funny. Um, I did not know it was a satire until after I'd finished it. Uh, it absolutely, absolutely brilliant. The characters in this book were very realistic. I thought that this book was going to depend very heavily on the miscommunication trope, and I absolutely hate that trope in any books, especially romance. So you're you're gonna have a 300 page book who it, 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 it's able to exist because two people refuse to have a five minute conversation like adults that would resolve all of the miscommunication and misunderstandings. Mm -mm, can't do it. Can't, won't do it. I really thought that's what this was going to be about. And there's definitely an element of misunderstanding and miscommunication in this, but it was handled so well and so realistically that it wasn't just something that necessarily you know what, get over yourselves, talk to each other for two minutes and everything will be fine. It it was handled so much better than that. And I absolutely loved these characters. And I think one of my absolute favorite characters is her father. Her father is hilarious. Oh my gosh. I can't wait to reread this. Is that weird? I feel like that's weird. But I, I absolutely loved this. And for reading it through the first time, I think if I read it through again, I would have a lot more to pick up on, things to annotate. Um, but I loved how different each of the sisters of this family were. They loved each other. They were, they were your typical sisters. They had things they didn't agree on. They had disagreements, they had arguments, um, but there was never cattiness, there was never backbiting. Um, they just had their own visions for how they wanted their lives to go. And I, I, it's so good. It's so good. I don't know what else to say about this. But if you're looking for a classic that reads very modern, that was the other thing. I thought this was going to have a lot of old English language that was going to be very hard to slog through and very hard to understand. And it did not. It was incredibly modern. I like this book had to be so ahead of its time. So if you're looking to get into a classic that is not too long, that is not very, you know, old English speech kind of, and you're looking for something that's actually going to make you laugh, but that has a good romance in it. Oh, I, I Pride and Prejudice is it, man. Just go for it. And now to absolutely no one's surprise, the first book that I read it in 2022, the first book that I had read in over probably 13 years, and my absolute favorite book of 2022, and now my favorite book of all time, The Count of Monte Cristo. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. I think I was pronouncing it Dumas for a long time, and then I was actually listening to somebody on YouTube that was saying, saying something about one of his books, and they said Dumas, and I was like, oh yeah, he is French. And the French really like not pronouncing all the letters and words. Um, so Dumas, I think, is the appropriate pronunciation of this book. And this is actually my brand new copy, um, which is why you don't see the annotations in it. Um, but like I was saying on my other videos, I didn't start annotating this until I got like this far through it. So I had like this much left to annotate and this was all unannotated. So I bought a brand new copy so that I can reread it in 2023 and annotate the heck out of it and also I plan to read this book once a year for the rest of my life because I love this book so flipping much. This is a story of a coming of age in a way. This is a story of injustice, seeking justice, revenge, vigilanteism. The, the guy's Batman. He just is. He's Batman. Um, Batman is also my favorite superhero. So, I mean... 
you know, it definitely had that going for it. This is a book, this is a mystery novel, this is a crime fiction, this is a master of disguise, this is a character study, this is historical fiction, this is so, so, so many things, and every single one of them is done so well, and every single one of them is, is threaded into the other so perfectly. This book can be all of those things at the same time without losing any quality of any one element of itself. This is the story of Edmond Dante, who is wrongfully imprisoned and spends 14 years in basically solitary confinement, uh, or what is supposed to be solitary confinement, but he ends up um, actually tunneling um, to the cell next to him with, well, the other guy does the tunneling, but anyway, he's, he becomes best friends with the uh, abbe uh, or priest in the cell next to him and for 14 years is trained in mathematics, science, language, religion, humanities um, from this abbey. And when he escapes his prison, he is led to an immense treasure that makes him probably the wealthiest person on the planet at the time. Um, and he enacts his plot for revenge against the people that he knows wrongfully imprisoned him. I, I can't, I can't even get into it more than that. It's so complex, but so easy to follow. And it's just phenomenal. This is one of the, this is the greatest adventure story I have ever read. And when I finished it, I was like, this book is not long enough. I need double this book. I need double, I need another, I need a sequel. I need something, but there is no sequel. So instead, I'm reading everything I can get my hands on by Alexandre Dumas. So I ended up reading The Three Musketeers. I finished that as my first book of 2023. I then set the book down, stared at the wall, and then picked up my phone and ordered The Red Sphinx, which is the second in the Three Musketeers series because The Three Musketeers is apparently a series. Didn't know that. There's like five or six books in it. Alexandre Dumas was an incredibly pro prolific writer fascinating person. I started researching about him when I finished this book. He was black. He was black. Did you know that the guy who wrote The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo was black? And it's amazing. His father served in the war for Napoleon. His father was like a black general or major. I don't remember the, the rank in the French army, but he was really, really highly ranked. very close to Napoleon, very personally um, tied to Napoleon and cared about him a great deal and then was very disappointed by the way Napoleon treated him. I, like, this is the coolest person I, I've ever read about. He is one of the most interesting authors I have ever had the pleasure to learn about and I just want to read every single thing he's ever read or everything he's ever written. He's, he's an absolutely stunning writer. He takes what should be really boring history and really brings it to life. And you learn so much about the time and the place and the people while being told the most entertaining story. So I, I cannot recommend, if you're gonna read one book in 2023, please make it the Count of Monte Cristo. Please, 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 please. You're doing yourself a favor. You're not even doing me a favor. You're doing yourself a favor by picking up this book. And so I highly recommend, highly, highly, highly recommend The Count of Monte Cristo. I am hoping that uh, Game of Tomes, the readers that get to vote one month will be voting for The Count of Monte Cristo because it is one of three choices, Jude the Obscure, The Stranger, and The Count of Monte Cristo to be paired up against the brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Everyone vote this. Vote, 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 vote. Okay. I'm, I'm done because I have to be done because I'm going to be, if, that's why I left this for the end because had I started the video, we would still be this far in and I would still just be talking about this book. Those are my best reads for 2022. Go check these out. At least one of the books on this list has to have been something that would have interested you, right? Right? Tell me down in the comments below. Tell me which of these books was the most interesting. I'm sure it's going to be The Count of Monte Cristo. I mean, I don't think that is going to be up for debate at all. But if it's another book, please feel free to tell me what it is and why it was more interesting to you than the most interesting book ever written. Um, 
But yeah, tell me down in the comments below, what was your favorite books of 2022? Give me recommendations uh, for what you think that I should be reading in 2023, maybe from your favorite list. And if you can do me a favor and leave a like on this video, I'm trying to get my first, first video that will get up to five likes. Let's make it this one. I hope you have a wonderful 2023. I hope you had a wonderful 2022. Keep reading, keep being kind to one another, and I will see you in my next one.